think you can already share your screen. It should work. Okay. So who do, you, who do we have in the audience? Uh, in the audience we have, uh, well, you're in, within Zoom. Yeah. We have the students. Mm -hmm. At the moment we have 45 students. Okay, so that's the, all the, the many I see are all students, basically. They are all students and mm -hmm. they are all invited to talk and discuss with you. And in addition, we have the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. There are people from all over the world or you know, the ones that reacted to your invitation as well can uh, listen to your talk and they can also use the chat. So I will see okay, some questions in the chat. Okay, good morning and welcome to another lecture in the frame of the module Emerging Fields in Architecture. Uh, today, I'm happy to listen to and discuss with Klaus Osterhuis. Thank you for coming, Klaus. Thank you. You will talk about the topic of interacting components in architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, to say a few words about you, Klaus Osterhuis is a, both a visionary and practicing designer, leading the innovation studio ONL, which he runs together with his partner in life and business visual artist Ilona Lennart. She's also a professor from practice digital architecture at the TU Delft and full professor at Qatar University. Uh, the leading theme for the design studio ONL, which has already been established in the late 80s, has been from the beginning the fusion of art and architecture on a digital platform. Today, um, Klaus Osterhuis will probably reveal some fundamentals of his personal design universe that embraces the paradigm shifts from standard to non-standard architecture and from static to dynamic environments. Thank you again for coming, Klaus Osterhuis. Yeah. The floor is yours. Okay, I'm going to start sharing the screen. Um, let me see. I must have my Is anything shared already? I cannot see it. Not yet. Okay. Okay, it is starting. Yes, now it works. I can see it. Mm -hmm. But I want to have it full screen. Yeah, okay, here it is. Um, okay, so you said the one hour lecture is sort of okay, is it? And then, and then one hour discussion, that's the format, is it? Yes. Okay. Wait. Let's see how far we come. I have a selection of 160 slides, so it's quite a lot. It's, it's mainly the visuals that tell the story. I will illustrate it with some text, of course, but the visuals are very important. And uh, But if there are specific questions, okay, we can have them afterwards. So let's start with uh, some basic uh, notions. Uh, in our work, I think it's the notion of the swarm. Basically, that every single component is a member of a swarm, be it a dynamic system or a static system. So realized buildings that don't move are typically static systems, but they still have the systemic approach of the swarm in the swarm where the components relate to each other in the design process in a dynamic way and in the executed version, sometimes dynamic, sometimes static. So that is the basis of actually everything we do. So in that basis, of course, we have our actors, we have our agents, we have the, the players who play that that game, basically, that is how we uh, usually look at this. Players playing the game, interacting with each other 
to form that swarm, to form that swarm on basic rules. These are the rules of Craig Reynolds, the, the voids. And then the bird is replaced by a triangle, but still it's the actor that actively is looking to its neighbors, to its nearest neighbors, that is, that is. And later you will see when we talk about building components, this is exactly what our building components are doing. They look to their nearest neighbors only. On top of that, there are of course governing rules that actually uh, uh, the display the, the rules of the game. And you have to be in the system, you have to play systemic, etc., to be able to play these games like the birds in a swarm are doing. So you have alignment, cohesion, separation. They, they more or less take the same direction. They want to come to the middle of it which is the cohesion. But then again, they don't want to bump into each other, which is the separation again. So there are very simple rules, actually telling the birds what to do. And this is uh, actually a crucial slide. I used it many times in lectures because this is still the swarm. It's still those birds looking at each other, not bumping into each other, aligning, but now based on external factors. And there's an external factor ruling the actual behavior of these actors. In this case, power lines. And actually you, we use this idea of power lines in our architecture to organize the components. So let's have a look at components, the very basic notion of a component. I was always fascinated from the beginning by containers for many reasons, actually. Uh, not so much for aesthetics, but for what they are and what they do. Because these are identities, they have a unique number. You can see it in the images. Um, they have a relationship, they are stacked. And uh, to each other, they form a bigger whole, and then they're transported, and then they act in a global network. This is a very systemic idea of a unit, of a building block, which I like very much. All these different scales that uh, actually contribute to this uh, global system. And what is even more interesting is you don't even know what is inside this container. It can be anything. So it contains maybe food, maybe other stuff, maybe even people that happens or, or smugglers. It contains everything. You don't know and you don't have to know. Only the one who knows the unique number, that person knows what's inside. And another thing that uh, comes to mind when uh, thinking of containers is the connections. So it's not about a building block in itself, it's always about the connections. More important than anything else, I would say it's the connections between the components that comes. Because if you don't control the connections, then you will have things clashing into each other, which is typical for uh, deconstructivist architecture, for example, that's clashing things into each other without thinking about how these components relate to each other. So our architecture and art also is much more based on how do they work together right, to form that bigger whole, and how can we sort of simplify the systemic system that it becomes a tool for everyone and not a, not an expensive uh, thing for an elite. Um, well, this is the swarm again, well organized, transported in a global network. If I would look at birds and migration of birds, it would look almost similar to this. So we have these global networks that are based on different components. So it can be organic components, can be inorganic 
components, it can be also be virtual components, and then we are talking about languages. Languages are based on very basic components, also languages which we don't speak, it's, uh, it, they follow the same system. It's basic components, basically an alphabet, and then amazing number of possible combinations between these components, between these letters, to form words, sentences, stories, etc., spreading all over the world, based on one single component and a definition of the relationships between the components. This, if someone reads Arabic, it would read uh, Seven Daughters here, which is basically the, the name of a project we are working on in Qatar right now. I cannot show the project, but it's uh, fascinating enough to actually have a look at how Arabic uh, script is uh, written and how free they are to express it in different ways, in calligraphic ways. So these are words. Other languages that are more virtual, like computer languages, by the way, but I don't dive too much into that, is, is music. So these things come through our senses, so through our organs. We make interpretations of things outside ourselves. We name objects, yeah, we find uh, sounds for objects, we find sounds for or words for objects, and then we construct an, a complete universe out of that, based on a single component or a set of single components. The same with music, it's just a number of notes, tones, with a certain hertz, and this uh, amazing number of possible combinations, how to use that and build your own universe in this. Um, so this is a part of, um, I always take things that have something to do with our private uh, enterprises. So this is part of Ligeti. And this uh, piece, it's from uh, Musica Ricasata. It's used in Eyes Wide Shut, the movie of uh, Stanley Kubrick. So someone who can read music already is hearing what it says. So this is the, the components that are actually used by instruments. So basically, this is also autobiographic. This is my baby friend, Piano. And it, it's used actually to, to actually perform these, uh, all these uh, possible combinations. And I think what we are doing in architecture and we should be doing is build instruments to use the digital in a, in a, in a very playful way and to build our own universe. Each one has its own personal universe to build your own personal universe using these basic uh, components and, uh, and explore the possible relationships between them. So it's not a given, there's nothing, nothing is given, everything is open and free to start composing. So I'm much more interested in composers than in performance. Right? Um, networks. The other week, there was an exhibition of uh, Professor Barabashi, who is the author of uh, some books on uh, networks and uh, interaction between components, books like linked, bursts, and the latest one is the formula. Uh, very interesting books to read. It's a bit, bit popular, popular science, but the images uh, that go with it in this exhibition in Budapest right now are quite strong. And it's, uh, it's clear they all look very similar in a way. Partly because everything is based on this idea of data points, data points and relation between data points. So we use that in our architecture. It's basically data points, coordinates, and the relations between one and the other. And then 
when talking about architecture, we form geometry. And that's what he was doing also in this exhibition. He interprets the data into geometry. And then you can visualize it in many different ways. You can 3D print it like this. And I have to say, I think the position in the third dimension of these nodes are quite arbitrary, but I have to ask him, what is the idea? But when we talk about architecture, it's very clear that you talk about the construction in space. This is a brain, I think, and all the interactions in brains and how we position ourselves in front of that. So he talks about hidden patterns. But when you use it in, in architecture, like we do, it's not so hidden, actually. It's fairly clear that we use the points, the point cloud as reference points to build our geometries and to build the interaction. And you should see, of course, uh, images like this, not as something static, but as something dynamic. Um, because it's uh, always an instance from a dynamic universe. It's, uh, everything moves, everything changes. For example, when you look at the module, which is the basis of everything we are built of, everything around us is built, built up from molecules, which is a set of smaller components again, combined into something like a word maybe, or uh, a tune. And then <clears throat> if you dive deeper into this, of course, this is very deceptive to have an illustration like this, because everyone knows it doesn't look like this. There is nothing like an atom. There is nothing tangible. If you would visualize it, it would be much better to visualize something like this. It's force fields. It's something like vibrations in the quantum realm. And the quantum realm is something we cannot even touch because we are caged. We are actually imprisoned in our molecular life. In that, and which I see as an as a very local and temporal crystallization of something that is immaterial. And but because we are part of this material world, we cannot actually step outside. So we are imprisoned in it. And, and one of my favorite uh, comparisons comparisons is that idea of flatland and spaceland. So if you live in flatland, which means you live on a horizontal plane or, one, or a plane and you cannot leave the plane, you will never experience something that is three-dimensional. It's impossible. The only thing you see is actually shadows passing by from that three-dimensional world or barriers passing by that you cannot uh, overcome. So it's interesting for me that if we think of constructing a world and interactions in that world, we must uh, um, realize that we have these limitations. And the only thing we can actually uh, find from something that is beyond this other dimensions is is uh, some yeah some remote echoes from it, but we keep trying, of course, to understand uh, the quantum reality. But I think for our uh, for our work, it's important that um, it's a universal thing, and if you want to dive deeper into the matter. Um, it's important to see the, to understand the components and their interactions and also the, the relative value of them. For example, when you go into the powers of 10, which is uh, Charles and Ray Eames video, when you go into outer space, you will soon be lost. I mean, it's so huge, it's so big. There's no reference to your own size anymore. If you dive into the micro world, 
and you would scale down yourself, it's exactly the same. It's a, there is no space. I mean, the space between what is supposed to be an atom or a molecule is so big that you wouldn't able be able to experience that at all. So you, you will be lost, basically, which sort of explains how we are confined to our own material boundaries. Still, it's uh, interesting to actually speculate about this and to find a clue how to overcome it. But that's probably an, an effort that will last centuries or even more. So for now, let's have a look at the complexity of something like a cell, which could be compared with a house. There's a lot of things working together to make it work. It's like a little factory. It's a processing unit. And that's actually how I want to look at everything that is a building component. It can be seen as a processing unit, as an actor, as a, instruments can be seen as input processing output devices. So in every system and every actor, information comes in, information is processed and uh, another form of information or materialized or immaterial is coming out of that. So everything is an actor is part of a dynamic system. A cell is part of a dynamic system, a building component it's part of a dynamic system, even if that component looks like this. It's, uh, it's, it's like the letters of the alphabet. You can construct many possible worlds out of this. And I show this because actually I was uh, commissioned. My first commission in life was to build a house in Lego. It was ex exhibited in Santo Pompidou in 1985. So we're talking 35 years ago here. Yeah. And the first thing I did is actually to say, okay, give me all the components you have and I will build a concept for a house out of that. So I made a, a record, a database of all the components, the exact number of co components that are used and that are needed, the identity of each component and on top of that, the conceptual meaning of that. So you have the database in one side, and then you have this conceptual uh, aggregation of these components at the other side. So you don't have to know one to understand the other, but it helps if you know how it, how it is built and if you know the smallest components. So here we have components like the X, Y, Z axis. The, the Z is for communication. The Y is for movement on Earth, and the Z, the, the X is for the, the house itself, which contains several components like chromosomes, like DNA, like functional components, shape components, etc. So it's quite conceptual in approach, but based on these smallest components, a very strong awareness of the smallest components to build anything, basically. And the black part in the back is actually, I imagined it to be a, a hole in the sky, basically. You're looking into the sky as a background. A bit later, when we were living in the, the atelier of Theo van Doetburg in Paris, we lived there for one year. I was asked to do an exhibition on Theo van Doesburg. And one of the things we did, this is back in 1988, is to do an animation of the Maison Particulière. It was of particular interest, of course, for us, because it was made out of com explicit components that were put together in a very precise and delicate way. Completely revolutionary in that time. So one of the things actually I can go a bit farther here is how we analyze the components and how we can put them together 
and I can stop the movie at any point here and actually make a painting like you have seen many paintings in that period of the stale period uh, that is composed uh, of these components. They are different, the component, not the same, but all of the same sort. So it's a very systemic approach like Piet Mondrian had when doing his paintings. This is a later painting, but it's based on paintings he did in that same period, like uh, around the twenties. This is a later one, but what is interesting here for me is again, that it's a dynamic system. It's not a static painting. No, it doesn't move, but you can see that he was moving all the, the dots all the time. He was using the bars as sliders to move the, the other components along these bars. He was changing the position of these bars all the time. So in the head of Mondrian, I'm absolutely sure that happened, that everything was moving. It was, it was part of a dynamic system, a dynamic universe, not a static universe. And then a painting is just an instance of that. The process is, is uh, very important, how you come to something that is an expression, in, uh, an instance of your personal universe. I think the same happens in our architecture, really. So let's talk a bit about rules. So everything is based on rules. So every artist, every architecture, composer finds rules. And one of the things I found intriguing at the time of my thesis, so when I was the, at your age, basically, of the students, I thought, okay, if we define a concept, a rule, can we also give it a shape? Why should have a national rule have the shape of the country? It didn't make sense to me. So I said, we can have a rule and also give it a shape. So basically that rule uh, would function as a bounding box in which that rule rules. And that's how architecture is. We have a bounding box, we have a site, we have a certain area and then Within that area, it, it evolved, basically. Uh, that's how we do it in, uh, in computing. You have a bounding box. You work within a certain working area, a working space. You define your space. And you can be very basic about this and actually define the, the space for an urban rule as well. It's not always a given site. You can define the shape yourself. So this was the basis of uh, my thinking at that time. Finding a strip uh, that is hovering over Holland and underneath that strip, that rule, that ruling strip, everything would be different. But the rules could be very, very small, like, okay, you can build without any supervision or the rule could be everyone owns a plot of land. Like you have birthright to own a plot of land in the United Arab Emirates, like in Qatar. If you are, if you are an, an inhabitant, a Qatari or an Emirati, you have the birthright to own a plot of land, which I find very good, very positive. We could apply this to, that was one of the rules I also, I was thinking here. So why don't we give everyone a piece of land? Meudon, uh, we live here, Theo van Doesburg, and this image shows one of the things we were actually trying to merge. So this is my XYZ house, this is a prototyping house I was working on. It's the other project, and this was a piece Ilona was working on using building materials actually, but you see that the expression is much more free, although the rules were just as strict, maybe even stricter. She used data points, computer sketching, creating data points and connecting the points. So basically each 
each point here, each edge was a data point. And these points were connected to form this stuff. And then if you compare this with this, actually my performance was quite poor because I have only eight data points per spatial component here. So three times eight is only 24. She had many more, much more complex and actually based on similar uh, structures, but a much more free way of expressing and playing with it. So we were wondering how to bring this together, how to bring that approach of architecture and, and art together in our projects. That was really one of the main endeavors of uh, our doings. So here you still see the XYZ as a tower, which would be an interesting tower, by the way, especially since I inserted here patio houses, but there is no ground. You would look down to the earth here. But the best we could do then is actually to have art as a decoration. Well, soon we found out this is not the way to go. Art should be completely merged with architecture and should operate on the same scale. So one of the first things was to make a very big piece of art and declare it inhabitable, declare it to be something that can be used as a building in different ways. Um, well, let's look at the, have a look at the very personal world of art. And then here the component, this is Ilona at work. The component here is a spontaneous intuitive gesture with a certain character. So this component in itself is a capricious movement. And then layer by layer, these uh, movements are like the letters of an alphabet, are like the, the building blocks, like the containers, like the, the Lego blocks to build up a complex universe. And the relations between these components, that web that is created becomes very intriguing and very spatial. A bit similar like Polo. She, she worked uh, with music, and this is uh, Sakamoto, I think. So it's Sakamoto at the piano, and she worked uh, along with the music and, in, in, and reacted, responded to that. Exhibition in, uh, in uh, Doha, where you see different versions of the, the paintings in this building, which is the summer palace of the Sheikh, one of the richest uh, persons in uh, Qatar, actually. And they gave us the, the whole place to uh, have this exhibition. Very nice. Okay, from intuitive gestures to a robotic painting. So I promised to say, tell something about robotic paintings. This is here. Um, it started with a sketch with a digitizer. And that sketch is full of energy. And that energy was analyzed into different components like the trajectory, like the speed, which is basically the, the space between the dots, like the angle, the angle of the the angle of the of the the marker, which Ivan has in her hands, and we use these as data and parameters, data points for the trajectories and parameters for the others to build. Uh, works of art. And by varying the different parameters, we created many different pieces based on the same intuitive gestures. And this can be seen as, an, as a nice interaction between analog movements and, uh, and computation and feedback from one to the other. I mean, 
we always look back, so okay, this has this effect, so why don't we do this to have another effect, etc. So there was this kind of collaborative action between the human and the robot. Here you see how the robot actually simulates those different angles, which results in uh, something that the line is not has not the same thickness. Uh, it, looks more uh, and more intuitive than if you see it in a computer screen where all the lines have the same thing. Uh, we did a robotic painting project in Dubai. The last one was in Rotterdam, so that was the pre-version, then we did one in Dubai where we actually brought a robot on site, which happens to be an important fact to bring the robot on site. And later I show an image that actually, I think this is also belongs to the future of building, that you bring fabrication to the site where you actually erect your building. So this worked very well. We made these uh, big paintings Again, based on uh, on sketches, on gestures, algorithmic interpretations of them, using fractals often, that you have the same movement uh, in different scales. Um, well, basically, in a fractal, you replace one segment with the whole thing. And then we mill the frames, even the vacuum cleaning was robotic. And then the result is a piece of art. It was the intention to make a piece of art. So it's collective effort, programmers, designers, artists, architects, which also I think is one of the biggest promises of the digital era that we work cross-disciplinary with basically anyone. This is robotic painting. Uh, we call that machine in motion again. Using, we had no budget. This was done in Qatar. Using vacuum cleaners to have two types of paintings. One painting is subtractive and the other is additive. So the subtractive one is actually taking away the flower from the, from the ground and the other is painting acrylic on canvas. And we had them working simultaneously. This was really a great event at Doha Fire Station in uh, Qatar. And no budget, there were, except for buying a vacuum cleaner, which can be programmed. So vacuum cleaners are programmable. Next building uh, a project I want to show is an art project called uh, Maidan. It exists of uh, 100 nodes for the 100 heavenly heroes. And here we come back to the idea of the bounding box because we use that flag as a bounding box to populate these 100 points into. And then we made the connections based on an algorithm that was shared, uh, taken from the internet. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's a very network construction both in the process and in the, the visual outcome of it. And in the night time, we would embed uh, thousands of LED lights actually to evoke uh, an image of that original revolution that took place in the Kiev, in the Maidan revolution. So it's pro fully programmable as a piece of art, and especially at night, that works uh, very well. Okay, I think I'm quickly running out of time, so maybe I speed up a bit. 
I'm, uh, but I have to go through this quickly. Prefab, prefab in the 60s. I was working for this guy. And then we made, together we made buildings like these. It's extremely prefab. It's minimizing the number of details, which makes it affordable, which is one of the secrets of our work. Minimize the number of differences, but actually work in a very systemic way. So this was uh, in 1987 that I did this. And it's the absolute minimum you can do in architecture, basically. And as you have seen, we were at the same time, we were looking at how can we bring art and architecture together actually to not limit ourselves to the extreme, but actually use the building blocks. These are also the minimum building blocks, but to use that idea of the building blocks to create a maximum of diversity. And that started in our saltwater pavilion projects. We had the curves, the, the gestures, we connected the curves with roofed surfaces and found ways to manufacture it. This is where we started to think of part of factory, actually scripting the structure and connect to the machines, which is another form of connection that is important to have one system that connects to the other system. It's machine to machine communication. A preview of the exhibition when it was almost finished. The thing I want to show here is not only the environment, which is fully programmed, uh, but also that, that light in the end here, which is an airbag. And we pumped it up, this airbag, every 15 minutes and deflated it again to have this alternating feeling of outside and inside, virtual environment, real light. So that is how we could play with it, with sensor boards. This was finished in 1997, so 10 years later than uh, my first project. Um, almost 20 years later, my first project was uh, 70, end of 70s, the uh, strip over Holland. This is 20 years later. Okay. But we were ready then for uh, going into this direction of fully programming, programming the behavior, using data from a weather station on the sea, making interpretations, create many signals for the light. So this is the light environment. It's all data and numbers. And the movie you saw before is how it actually expresses itself. It's very rich, very diverse. We found ways to uh, to script the, the complexity by analyzing the curvatures into segments with specific radii and communicated this in a very uh, strict, uh, organized, systemic way to the machines. So basically we produced the numbers that the machines would need to actually do their thing. So we could say we used the machines as an instrument actually to materialize the, the idea. So the sketch you see here is very similar to such an intuitive gesture that I showed before. It's actually the direct translation of a three-dimensional sketch into reality. Okay. Uh, inside this bounding box, which is the shape of the water pavilion. It's a sculpture building, a building like a sculpture. There's nothing that reminds you of a real building. Doors like this are cut out of the skin. This is how the skin rests on the rocks. There's no, no such thing as traditional foundations. It's a completely different approach to architecture as a piece of sculpture. But designing the skin as well, the skin textures, everything has actually rethought, uh, reconsidered how to build architecture. It was leading to this uh, quite extreme uh, position that we took, that for a building to reach a complexity like this, you need to reduce at one side the number of components. Yeah, you basically, it's a limited alphabet, 
that you're using, but you use it to create a maximum of diversity. A constructive structural system was uh, mapped onto that surface and then analyzed. So now it's the, the total of the building that was basically one detail. One building, one detail. It's amazing how effective this was and how cost effective it is. So it looks like it's too much work. It looks like it's expensive, but actually it's not. Because you limit the number of details and you and the detail includes all the materials eh, and the connections between the components. The architectural idea was to have a sort of hard crust around something that was glowing from the inside. So apart from all these technical issues, there is, of course, the conceptual idea. And what do you want at all? What, will you, what do you want to do with your instrument? So you can rethink from scratch using build your own library of components and uh, develop the connections and then create your personal universe, your own diversity, which can be completely different from anyone else, but still based on the same principle. I think that's how nature works, by the way. Um, the doors are again cut out of the skin. So it's not something that comes from another system and that is then implemented in your building like all traditionals do. They all take things from a standard catalog and then they put it together somehow. That's not what we do. We actually build our own catalog and work from there. So it's obviously a piece of architecture because you can enter. Now it's not so obvious when it's closed. You don't see the entrance. And that's another idea we have, and that will come back in some movies I show a bit later. There is only a door when you need a door. I mean, that's the idea. Why should you see a door or have a door at all if no one enters there? So this door is only there, and it forms a canopy, so I can extend this idea to there's only a canopy if people need that protection. So why do we have these fixed canopies in front of buildings when there's no one to, to shelter underneath it? This is a basic idea why dynamic architecture and interactive architecture is reasonable. It makes sense because there's no reason why you should have an empty office building if there's no one working inside. And like we have in these corona times. Uh, in front of the faculty building components, this is the, the lab, lab inside, but unfortunately the, the whole project was uh, torn down because of the faculty burned down. You probably know that. So we had to start again, think of a new uh, lab, lab. And then this is uh, my originator sketch. I asked the students to work with it playing different roles, playing the role of a structural designer, a climate designer, interaction designer, a shape designer, etc., material designer, playing different roles to come to a, a new systemic approach for a, 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 a diverse, uh, complex uh, structure based on very simple rules and components. So we 3D milled the components, robotically milled. This was done 10 years ago. And we designed the, the connections such that it would always fit and it would uh, be strong to be a floor, a wall, a ceiling, everything in one. It uh, brings me to uh, a movie that we made recently to show what we think is the future. You bring robots on site, you print your components, they're all different. You lift them up 
and bring them into the location. Everything is, of course, based on data points. And each component has a reference point and has the, the reference to their nearest neighbors. And you can build basically anything based on that technology, based on that systemic approach. And you can build parts of that dynamically. You can, and that's, I ask students again to do this, take one of these components and make it interactive and make it such that it forms the lecture stand when someone lectures in the GSM conference that we have. So here we see the components uh, assembled together and in the front. We added this one component that becomes the lecture stand when someone lectures. And after the lecture was gone, it would actually uh, come back to its original position. So this was the idea of, okay, there's only a lecture stand if you need one, which uh, we elaborated further in uh, more radical ideas that also furniture and other parts of the house only need to be there when you need them. About program programmability, this is a project we did in Qatar as well. Um, it's uh, a number of components, but now inflated components. And the components in the middle part can inflate and deflate, which makes the whole thing go up and down. It can dance, so to say, and it reacts to also stimuli from outside, just to show because it was a beautiful project. So it leads to scripting all over, scripting complete buildings like this cockpit building uh, along the A2 highway in Holland near Utrecht. It's in that part that you see is fully scripted. The acoustic barrier is fully scripted. No 3D drawings were made, basically. Things were modeled, but only in this in this way, if we're modeled like, okay, these are the components and these are the relationships between the components. And then this as a system was mapped on the population of points, data points of that structure. We did this for the acoustic barrier and the cockpit as well. Results in a showroom that has the price of a normal box actually but it's seen as a very special terminal for expensive cars. We applied the same for the Balna Budapest, it's the interior. And then to go even more into basics, this is the component of a climbing wall system we developed where the skin and the structure work together in one component. So it's even fabricated as one component and then assembled together to form the whole. It all follows the same logic. It's uh, open for manipulation from outside, from curvature. So we could map the curves, curvatures onto the system. And then the system would actually see how, how it is, well, what are different angles between the components are, if it's acceptable or not. So we could play with that with different parameters assemble it, building it together to form a very complex climbing wall. Whereas <coughs> the holes that you see up there, the, the openings, it looks uh, complex, but it's not. It would be exactly the same complexity as if that wall was completely straight, which you see more to the left. It's exactly the same system. There's no uh, uh, Operating, no, it doesn't uh, need uh, an extra line of script. I mean, everything is embedded in the basic script, so it's very inclusive and it can be applied to basically anything. This is a tower we did in Abu Dhabi, where the skin and the structure are fully synchronized to form the building and also visible from the interior. Apply to a chair, a body chair, a com basic component, laser cut, 
or water jet cut in other occasions, folded and assembled together. There's different variations for the cushions and for the patterns, all parametric. So from this one system, you could uh, design many different chairs based on this application where you could uh, actually decide what is your, or, or you would uh, put, uh, give the numbers of your own body. That's why it's called body chair. So what is the length of your leg, your torso, etc. So it becomes your chair and you can also decide on the inclinations. It's, it's more active chair or more passive, all from this one volume that can be tweaked by playing with the sliders. This I think is a, is a very good approach for any future architectural project that you design the system, you design the instruments, and then you let others play with it. So you let others play with the, the parameters and let others decide what is the final shape for it. Well, I, I rush a bit through this. Uh, Mondrian interpreted as uh, a city, uh, the Boogie Woogie, the, and we lived in New York, so it makes quite a sense. It was unfinished, so we thought, okay, we can work with that. We can continue working with that concept and make a three-dimensional, 3D printed uh, project out of this. We can make carpets. This is Ilona's work and not my work. We can make uh, tapestries for the wall. We can make 3D printed versions of it. It's open for manipulation, all based on that component dynamic universe that can be manipulated parametrically. And now we come to the, the core of this lecture. It's a bit late already, so I have to rush a bit. Uh, interacting components. Now imagine this, this is a space station interior. Imagine this as components that can be changed in length. So each of those edges that you see in between the data points are components that are basically cylinders that are basically uh, uh, components that can uh, vary in length. They have a stroke like maximum 1.4 and by using that stroke you can create different environments, completely different environments by just programming the individual lengths of each of those components. This was done for a newspaper in 1980, I think 1998. And based on that idea we continued, we evolved this idea, okay, we can do this in larger structures. We can make buildings that have flexible skin and have these actuators inside to change their length, which would be actually quite simple to do. It looks complex maybe, but it's not, it's quite simple. And we develop games to unfold inside that moving structure, that structure that always would propose different uh, formations to you and you would respond to that in a game-like environment. This was the idea. So quite radical for architecture because it would mean that architecture would never be something. That's too much noise. This is me explaining for Italian television how it works. It's the Biennale 2000, where we had the central space in the Italian pavilion. And we made this immersive interactive environment where the public could actually play with the configurations of this water pavilion-like structure. The public would be able by moving in the space to change the dimensions of these members of the structure. So this could be translated into something materialized. Okay, this was 2000, but unfortunately no one came to us yet 
to build something in real life, which could be very easily feasible, actually. We also use the same environment, use the same environment to make a work of art based on data points that can vary their presence, their life, their lifetime, how long they live, and uh, the thickness of the points just by moving into that in that space. Another project we did, something from do similar. It's an inflatable structure and muscles that actually control the shape and the movements of that structure, interacting with the public. Here it looks uh, from the inside, you see all the cables coming, going to the muscles, and it's the difference in air pressure of these muscles that they either relax or expand. And when they expand, they become shorter. When they relax, they become longer. And then they operate together as a swarm, as a flock. Again, then you can create these difference in movement. Here it's visualized that uh, we used turtles software for the, um, the numbers you see in the middle part are all the different uh, configurations of each individual muscle. So three is relaxed, one is contracted, etc., and two is in between. One of our PhD students did this for me to show actually the tweaking data points in real time is could be very useful as a design tool right? to design your thing. It's uh, more dynamic than any existing software. And also it was to show that you can organize your points in such a way that it's either completely regular and I think that comes in a moment somewhere, that, that mo moment that all these points are actually well organized to form a house. It's exactly the same system, exactly the same components, exactly the same attitude. So you can choose actually, meaning that I wanted to say, to explain with this, that this way of building an in-design instrument is inclusive. It includes every possible configuration, including rectangular structures, if you like that. The other way around, it's impossible. If you start with uh, platonic volumes, you will never end up with complexity and you will never end up with something that could be interactive. Like this, this should be a movie. Yes, it's a movie. Like this interactive wall structure we did for Festo. This is in their headquarters in Stuttgart. And we actually used our technology, our brains connected to their wings. That's their technology. And we made a move using muscles. There were sensors in the base, then walking along this structure, it would actually trigger the structure to move and to, uh, to manipulate by moving along, manipulate different uh, configurations. Of course, it's a matter of programming what these sensors do. Nothing is done by itself. So it's a matter of being a composer uh, building an instrument and then making a composition with those uh, basic components and have them interact. Applied on a larger scale, we could think of something like this, like, okay, there's a train that makes noise and only when the train is there, we need to block the noise. So it's the same motto as I said before, there's only a barrier when you need one. If there's no noise, why would you have a barrier? Why would you have these ugly, ugly sound screen, sound barriers in the urban landscape if there is no noise? So if you have a dynamic system, you can respond to external stimuli and respond to it in such a way that the society becomes much more open and it's only there when it's needed and as needed. 
here the components are similar, yeah, they are repetitive, but not necessarily. You can also have any any different kind of configurations. Well, since it's for students, uh, this is a student work. This can be easily done by students. It's a, a mirrored ceiling which responds to the people walking under these. There are sensors built in, prox proximity sensors. If you come closer, it rebuilds the reflections. That is also why it's called Reflect Ego. So it has this conceptual ID. It has the components and it has the, the programming in real and the operation in real time. So it's, it processes information basically. Everything, every member of the flock, every member of the swarm processes information, whether in a static form or in a dynamic system like this. Whether on the small scale or whether on the big scale, it's another student project or the World Expo design, where they design these floating components that respond to people walking on them. And they are also self-assembling, so they could uh, have small motors in each component that they can rearrange themselves in different configurations and go to different places. So you see that it has a huge potential for spatial excitement uh, for spatial urban configurations and you could apply it to complete buildings eventually. But as we live in society where building is very traditional, it takes time before we reach a level like this. But it's again it's very simple. All these uh, things you see on the on the lower side of the components are inflatables. So if you change the inflation, you change the configuration of the whole triangular component. Another student project. Also showing that it's not necessarily to think about uh, triangles or com complex uh, geometry. The complexity can also be in based on more simple geometries like these cubicles. And these cubicles are fully programmable. They can move by themselves. They can reconfigure themselves. They can internally, they can be reconfigured to become a component that is a, is a stair to go up to the next level or to become a space or to be empty. So interior in the cubicle is fully programmable, exterior, uh, to the uh, to the cubicle, it's also completely programmable. So that's, I think, a good definition of a dynamic environment where everything is programmable. This is a pop-up house that we designed a few years ago. Where okay, the idea was okay. If if we need to go to bed, then there is a bed. No, if we need the kitchen, then there we have the kitchen. If we need a lounge area we have a lounge area but if we don't use it we don't need it so it's the beauty of a of an empty space it's the beauty of a, almost a zen space that uh, it uh, can adapt to the function that you're actually imagining at that time it can be pre-programmed for example when you're coming home you can say okay i want the kitchen now you just use your application and you said you just click the, the choice kitchen and it will do that. So all these uh, components are in themselves built up, built off on other components and they actually relate to their neighboring components. They relate in a network to people playing the whole system as an instrument. So this is actually a good definition of uh, our attitude, whether it's art or whether it's uh, architecture, 
uh, whether it's small scale or it's the larger scale, I think it works in this way. It works in nature like this way. And it works in new nature, which is the extension of of organic nature, our new nature where we are the main players. So basically, I see everything. I think we could well end with this uh, video and keep it moving, where I consider everything that we built as a sort of exo, exo human, exo body uh, materialization. So a grand piano is, ex, is an exo vehicle to express ourselves through sounds. Like uh, a house is an, is an exoskeleton, basically, where we hide every now and then, where we go into, where we go out of. Uh, and we actually only we serve as the, as the actors and as the as the information at the same time. Because by entering a house by, or by programming a house, to, you sort of provide information to that house. And that house processes that information. It processes your movements and it has a result, an output, which is again related to other houses in a complex network called cities called uh, countries and yeah, national and uh, in the end uh, into a global structure. So basically it's the awareness that every component is part of a global network, like our brains are part of a global network. I mean, our brains could not function without having a relation with others. Same is for any other component. A single component doesn't exist. It only exists in relation to other components. And as we talk architecture, it only exists. We can, then we can have a good definition, a good clear definition of the component, a good clear co definition of the rules governing it, the programming of it. And we can have a clear, clear definition of how they connect through information or through physical connections. Okay, I think I'll leave it here. I'll leave it open for questions. I hope you're not exhausted by this and are still with us. So Sandra, I give the floor to you to, to have the students uh, participating. Thank you very much, Kaz. Um... Yeah, thank you for your lecture. As expected, it was a, a really great and inspirational lecture. Thank you also for showing the, the old projects from yourself and showing the red line of your ideas behind it. I, um, I like what you said, uh, complex but not complicated. Can, yes, I start with one? Can I start with the first question? I because when you talked uh, about this climbing wall, it looked like, like many other uh, projects that you have very different components. But probably mm -hmm. you have only a few components. And what I wanted to know is, how do you deal with the connections? Is the angle, the angle design some kind of a rule, for example, so different uh, uh, parts fit together? Uh, well, okay, the, it's one component, but each component is different. Huh? You have to realize how that works in parametric design. They all follow the same rules. So every component is different. Every piece of wood is different. So every skin piece is different. Every structure piece is different, every angle is different between the components because they adjust parametrically to the position they have in, in the arrangement, in the configuration. So if the configuration uh, is straight, well, of course, then they're all equal, but they still would have their own identity because being equal doesn't say anything. 
in such a system. Actually, if you would uh, arrange the components in such a way that some components are equal and some are not, it's more complicated than if you don't do that. So if you have the same rule, but only change the angles, so from 90 degrees to 180 degrees to another angle, it's still the same system, it's still the same rule. And the machine making it, which is the CNC router, which the five axis uh, had, that CNC routing machine knows these angles. So you communicate the angle straight away from the model to the machine. That's how, that's how the whole process is automated. So it's completely different than any other climbing wall you have seen, although it might look similar because it's, and it's much cheaper by the way. Thank you. Are there any questions from the students? Mm, I have one. Um, thank you for so much food of um, thought. I thought um, the lecture was very interesting, especially I liked the idea of um, the moving structures, mm -hmm. like the canopy or the things with the furniture. But often, at least I have the feeling that the, the moving parts um, doesn't or don't um, function properly. Like the, I always think of the um, Musée de Rap or um, from Jean Nouvel. So how can we bridge that? Um, by, well, the Musée de Mont Arabe, this is, uh, well, let's, let's put it this way. It's, it's very ancient technology to make the things move. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very mechanical. And if there's one thing that is problematic in uh, moving things, it's the mechanical part always. It's, it's never the, the program, it's never the software, it's never mm -hmm. the, the, the way what they are told to do. So I think the, the trick is to keep it as simple as possible, the way how they are connected. Don't make it mechanically complex, complicated like a watch or something like that, because it will fail at a certain moment yeah. or it will be very expensive. That's the other option of there. So in the Institut du Monde Arabe, I think many fails. I, I, I'm not even sure it works at all. But if uh, the interactive installations we have done, this uh, hyperbody group, we never had those failures actually, not really. Because um, well, I, I can show many more examples of that and you can find it on the hyperbody.nl archive sites. You can find uh, movies as well. It, uh, it always worked somehow. And, uh, I'm not sure why that is, but I think because we reduced the complexity the, or the complicatedness, I have to say, we, so we reduced the number of different components. So they're all the same. So they all follow the same, uh, the same instruction, basically only with different values. So once you solve this one thing, you only have to solve one thing. If you solve this one thing, it works. Mm. So I think it comes down to that. Okay. And then it's similar to uh, our projects in real life, like the static structures, like one building, one detail. Concentrate on this one building, if that mm. works, and you can spend a lot of time on that. If that works, everything works. Mm. Okay. Uh, I have a question as well. So um, you started uh, your talk with, uh, with emergence, like uh, smaller parts make something which is bigger than some of the parts. Mm -hmm. Like uh, a cell is a living thing, the smallest we have, but it's made out of dead things. And um, I was uh, going through my head for examples and I ended up uh, with uh, old uh, medieval uh, inner cities in Europe, which uh, 
looking back from house to house, they are maybe not that important, but together they make the city and make it um, bigger than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. But uh, also staying with this example, it's getting more complicated since the house itself is also is a unit, but also holds units, and you know it gets complicated very fast. Mm -hmm. So um, I was looking uh, uh, to it more like a tool, like uh, you want to you have your parameters, and you want to make it uh, a unit which is small enough to 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 be as efficient as possible and to do the task. Uh, at hand as efficient as possible yeah but um, but you also are limiting yourself since um, the more parameters the more you uh, the more problems you have um, the smaller the part has to become to be as flexible as possible so I'm wondering uh, how do you cope with um, with uh, finding like the sweet spot uh, not too complicated uh, a task to to to, to be handled by one single unit or the units together. Um, so yeah, is it is it um, a tool which can on, only be used in certain areas where the parameters aren't um, that um, um, that uh, convoluted to say? So yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, how should I put this? Um, I think you have to. Uh, you have to allow yourself to rethink what is a house. So if you, for example, want to post parameterize or everything that's, uh, that you see around you and you see everything, you know, like tables, uh, book, bookshelves, paintings, doors, lamps, everything, computers. I mean, it's so diverse. It's, a, it's an ecology of things. Um, if you see the, the, the house is also part of an ecology of things in a smaller scale, interior and exterior. I think if you want to copy what you see around you and post parameterize it, you will fail enormously because then you're, you're uh, you are caught in that idea of complicated. It becomes very complicated because it's based on different ideas. It didn't originate in, this, in that way, like that the house is one systemic system that uh, that functions in all aspects properly. That actually doesn't use energy. That uh, that uh, doesn't create waste. That is. Uh, is recyclable, that is uh, circular, all these components you can easily uh, project on that single component and start completely from scratch, redefine everything, and then it will be quite effortlessly you could do it. For example, in the, the Game Set Match 3 conference stand, uh, that uh, those units that we made for the Protospace lab, each of those components can have a different function. One component can be a climate function. One component can catch the, uh, the, sol the solar energy or ar array of those components because otherwise you don't have enough. Some components could be these interactive furniture components. Other components could be um, uh, providing for light. Etc. So all these different aspects, what makes a house, could be easily embedded in that one single component. But that single component is at the same time many components. No component is the same. No bird is the same. No gesture is the same. So they're all different, but following the same rules with variables and. If everything is variable, like the body chair, you can make from this one system, you can make many different ones. So, but you have to rethink completely. You have to really rethink from scratch and not copy, um, and not metaphorically copy something that is already existing. So you have to think very elementary and 
really define your basic uh, units and work from there and then take advantage of all the possible configurations and diversity you can create from there. Does this answer your question? Uh, hopefully. <laughs> but you cannot do everything at the same time. You cannot rethink furniture. You cannot rethink everything at the same time. I mean, it's a, it's a huge effort. So you have to concentrate on one thing to make that work. And then other things, you'll make other things work. And then you combine everything. And then eventually you build up a complete new ecology. I think it will happen eventually because there's so, there such a strong logic in it. Yeah, so like one task at a hand. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. I, I do have a question which maybe connects somehow to this. So you said architecture is nowadays more traditional and it takes some time to, to get to this modern aspects of uh, yeah, of architecture in general. And I'm wondering if you think this is especially related to residential housing, if there is some evolution embedded in this architecture, or do you think it is just ignorance, not, uh, not taking this technologies right now? Um, well, it's not ignorance. It's, uh, it's uh, real. Well, maybe it is because I think once you realize that there is not something like residential or there's not something that is office or something that is school. I mean, it's about a space, no? A space that you inhabit and use in a certain way. Um, it's, it's not very related to each other. So the basic idea is, okay, why can't we make a more generic space that can be adjusted to different kinds of use? Make that space gen uh, generous. Yeah, not too small. Just for uh, as a private uh, private note, we always lived in school buildings because we like the classroom as a space. We don't. We never lived in a residential, actually, because that is predefined how to use it. If you if you use a classroom, you can define it for yourself. So that would be a first step in to actually do away with housing as such but build spaces instead that can be used for any purpose i think for a city like vienna it would be ideal just stop building housing stop building offices build spaces and make them multifunctional and and allow them to be used in many different ways so well one, one thing I noticed when I came to Budapest for the first time is that the whole interior city, and it's, it's most old cities is the same. You have these residential complexes, but half of it is used by, by lawyers, by officers, by small enterprises, and they mix effortly, effortlessly with people that are housed and that are, let's call it their home. So one door can be an office, next door can be a home, but they all use the same structure, which makes up a very lively city because every, something happens all the time in such a building. It's a 24 hour concept. So I'm very much in favor of that. Just building spaces and forget about uh, these predefined functional uh, way of uh, approaching it and limiting that and fixing that in, in, in rules that are not essential. So we should go back to much more essential rules, I think. And I think it's not, not difficult to do, actually. You can do it right away, but it needs a different mindset. And it needs probably a political position as well. Because how do you divide the spaces? Eh? Because uh, that's uh, who has the right to use a space. That's another question. But also that can be subject to similar strategies. Like I mentioned uh, in, uh, in the Middle East where you have birthright to a plot of land. So if you have birthright to a plot of land, there wouldn't be this 
extreme difference between um, poor and rich because everyone would be able to afford it in basic. So the basis, and which is similar to ubiquitous basic income, if everyone has this basis, we would have a completely different society. So it's all related to uh, these kinds of ideas, I think, to this idea of being ubiquitous and ubiquitously available for everyone. And then also spaces can be more gen generic and ubiquitously available to adapt to different uh, ways of usage. And then it becomes dynamic because society changes all the time. And you see that now with uh, Corona, of course, with COVID-19, that half of the office spaces are just empty. They are not used. So it's, uh, it's, it's a waste of space. And then there's an, a renewed interest in working at home, of course, which is normal. I'm working from home right now here. And uh, <clears throat> there's nothing more normal than that. The only thing you have to secure is that you're connected, like we are connected right now. I, I would even say we wouldn't even be connected like this, almost one to one, that uh, than before the COVID crisis. So I think this is a very positive uh, development, but we should we should learn from it. And I, I think we can apply this to many aspects of society to improve it, to improve uh, inequality, to improve the whole question of food, for example, bring food much closer to where you live, etc. food production, urban farming. It's all related. They build networks of smaller units that work together to form the bigger whole. I think that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Well, Sandra is waiting for her students. Okay, I would have a question if nobody's on the line. Mm -hmm. Hello, Mr. Esterhis. I uh, want to thank you about your presentation. I think it was very um, like easily understandable, simply but complicated. One thing that or most of your points that caught my attention was um, the idea of you, um, of you, your concept, architecture concept, on including the users into your project, as we saw in the um, application house uh, example, or at the chair example, or mm -hmm. at the movement sculptural um, uh, building that you had with the uh, like, uh, with based on the movement. Um, changement of heights in the building i wanted to ask why is it that important or so important for you to include the users into your projects i mean like as humans we are prone to um be provided with solutions and in this time and your concept we are kind of uh invited to be part of the solution so um yeah. why is that is so important <laughs> yeah well I think it's a natural development to go in that direction because I think what we are doing, and I could have shown different projects that we actually, how we include the other people in the design process in a participatory design platform. I'm working on several projects right now to actually to promote this and to build the, the instruments for this. So more and more, I see myself and architects as instrument builders, like serious gaming like structures, that is more inclusive. So it's not only the geometry that's more inclusive, it's the whole process, <coughs> how data are processed, how information is processed, that becomes easily much more inclusive because of all the connections between different disciplines and between the experts and the laymen and the users. 
So we can all play the same game, or we can all play the same instruments, so to say, which and I think is fascinating. And I think it's a natural development of the digital, of the digital technology. It's an inclusive technology. I mean, you see it spreading around the world so easily, <clears throat> even so fake news is spreading even faster than uh, COVID-19. I mean, it's all based on the same, no? it's all based on information processing and having instruments to do that. So it's such a natural development. So I cannot, I cannot say it, it will go into another direction because no one actually wants to be excluded in the end. You want to be part of something. So if, you, if it's a house, why wouldn't you be part of that? Right. Um, and, but of course, if architects keep doing the same, they always did, like being the, the authority that tells the users this is good for you, then nothing happens. I mean, then there will be no, no real participation. So the, the next step I am proposing here is to build instruments to include the users, actually only to tweak the parameters and not the rules. So still the design of the rules of the game is architect's job. But to play with the parameters is like playing a game. It's like playing a tennis game. No, you have the rules. You just obey the rules, that's okay. I respect the rules, but I play my game. I can be uh, a serve and volley, I can be very aggressive, I can be a baseliner, I can be anything, but I play my game based on these rules. So I see something similar happening in architecture that we design these kinds of rules, set of rules, which I call them an instrument, and that the users are free and actually invited to play with it and to build their environment. But their environment, again, is temporal and local, and it's not a generic solution for everyone. And uh, based on your experience, um, how is their approach to this, to this uh, possibility given to them? Because no. usually the users... It, I mean, like they are given possibility to be uh, a part of the project or the, or the whole process as you suggested, but uh, not in this scale, because I think this is very innovative, mm -hmm. very new. It's going to be oh. part of our near, near future, I guess. Yeah, well, we have developed a, a serious game called Participator, and we work with project developers on this. And I have to say they were very enthusiastic because they, they suddenly felt that okay it's not we are not a victim of what an architect proposes but actually we can actually discuss we can talk yeah, on the same level we are in the same level playing field mm -hmm. and they appreciated that very much so that's for the the higher level of uh, developers and but similar the same is with users because everything they do and in the participator instrument actually you can trace uh, lines you can trace trajectories which then act as attractors to attract these basic units i was talking about everyone can do this it's not the architect that traces and then it's being appreciated or not appreciated by the others now everyone can do the same. So everyone becomes a creator in that uh, setting, which is very much appreciated, I have to yeah. say. And it, it can really happen, and I think it happens often actually, that it's not in the end not the architect that is participating in the game, but someone else who has the best idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. <laughs> So um, I have a question because you're talking now about this, um, the users like they are a component and how do you make it sustainable if the components like the users are changing all the time um, and 
if the compo uh, the users are in this process, then you're making a system or a building just according to their, I don't know, their feelings. Mm -hmm. And so how it is, how is it um, for everyone and for a longer period of time? Um, how can it work? Well, there's a, I think there's an, an interplay between the generic and the specific. So you're talking about a user, it's very specific, probably wants to build a very specific environment for her or himself. Uh, but if the rules they are playing with are generic, the outcome of the game, the design game, would be specific arrangement of generic components. I mean, it would still maintain that uh, that uh, polarity of at one side it's very generic and usable for everything or adaptive to everything and the other side it can be locally and temporarily being adapted for a specific person so i don't see a conflict there really but it needs a good definition of what actually the rules of the game are actually dictating. If they di dictate every specific detail, so there's no more room to move, but only to move in that direction of that specific person, then I don't think the rules were, were not set properly. Then the rules are too specific. I think the rules must be very generic, that it creates an open structure for everyone to become specific within those rules. And being adaptive is only one aspect of it. Eh? That this applies both to static environments and, uh, and dynamic environments. Okay, thank you. Um, so I wonder, if when you have these dynamic buildings that you showed many pictures um, to us, how do you place that in the city? So do we probably have um, examples or have you worked with urban development? How to put these dynamic buildings in a rule for the city? Like how can they be dynamic in the whole urban development? Are you thinking of larger buildings or? Um, I'm thinking of um, the connection between different buildings in the city. Oh, okay. okay. For example, if uh, this building would be adjacent to a static building? Yeah, for example, if you have um, existing buildings and you have or you want to find a rule how to um, place these new dynamic buildings next to mm -hmm. it. Like, how well, do they adapt to this uh, existing structure? Well, well, maybe they don't, or maybe they adapt later. But basically, like I said, you have a working space. So the dynamic of that specific building would actually unfold within the, this bounding box. And if you have static neighbors, then that's where the bounding box ends. Okay. And if the neighbor wants to respond to it, well, that's their decision. It's not something I can have influence. On. That's a natural process. But that takes, in a city, that would take a long time. Okay. Be be before one building has an influence on another building, you can talk, uh, you yes. can talk ages. It can be 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. Yeah. So you have to think this in a very long-term planning schedule. Yes, so when I think about, like, for example, building a complete new city, you have these bounding boxes wherein the dynamic buildings can't expand. Mm -hmm. But um, would there be, for example, a system that includes the whole city if I create a new city? Oh, yeah. Can I have rules within yeah. rules? Yeah. Do you know what sure, I mean? You can. Yeah, yeah, it would be an interesting project. Basically, it would be an ex expansion of that idea of one of those student projects where these uh, uh, basic spaces uh, rearrange themselves 
uh, both internally and externally in relation to others, you could see a city as a dynamic system that rearranges itself all the time. Something comes to mind here. For me, that, that there's actually a, a project of Super Studio. It's called, I think it's called the Nine Cities Project. One of those nine cities is a city that constantly produces itself and also destroys itself in the tail end and produces itself in the front end. So it grows, it moves. It's not a static uh, system, it moves in the country and in the tail end it uh, sort of destroys itself and disappears which is of course in there maybe it's a bit critical i think also a metaphor for uh, for that uh, cities change well the cities do change all the time so it also happens without moving of course it happens on the same spot but it takes time it's a longer time frame we're talking about but new cities or existing cities, I don't see a real difference, really. I'd rather work in existing cities, because it's more, more interesting, more diversity. And, uh, but I don't see a real difference. It works from inside out and from outside in at the same time, I think. So the dynamic system would respond to external stimuli and also it would work from, from the inside within its own bounding box, having influence on their uh, nearest neighbors. Yes, I, it's, I think it's like that. It looks like a very natural process you are actually uh, potentially thinking of. Yeah. And, uh, parts of that can be dynamic. And dynamic means doesn't mean it has to move very fast, huh, by the way. Dynamic changes can be very slow as well. And one of the interesting things of programming a movement is that I can program it to move even less than static buildings, which is uh, actually a good thing to think about. For example, there's one ex good example here. There's a big tower is being made in uh, Saudi Arabia. It's uh, one mile high, high almost, I think, but they stopped building it. But okay, part of the, the Part of the structure was actually to embed actuators in that building. And when you have strong winds at the top, the, the whole building would actually swing back and forth several meters, which would cause nausea. You would not feel that. So what they have, they have actuators in the building to resist. Like you stand up for yourself. You do the same yourself when you stand. It's a, it's a system of not falling, eh? as you know. Standing is basically a dynamic version of providing the, the not falling. So you resist all the time to leaning too much forward, and you go a little bit backward, or if there's a strong wind, you lean towards the wind, etc. So you position yourself in a very dynamic way in your environment. The future of large buildings is exactly the same. They position themselves like that. They respond to different weather conditions, and especially in this case to different uh, wind forces. So yes, it already it already is embedded in buildings, but you can imagine, and that's one of the things I coined in around 2000, you can also have environments that are proactive, that not respond to changing environments, but actually propose changing environments to actually propose a stimulus for the movements inside that building to guide the people in a certain direction. It's, uh, it could be even applied to crowd control in a way that you can have different configurations of the interior of the building if it's too populated at a certain area, you just change the configuration you respond to what is happening. And you can also predict this and become this and be proactive in proposing different configurations. So yeah, there's a lot of, of logical ways of uh, working with this. And again, I think there is no, no escape from thinking in dynamic systems instead of static systems. 
it has so much to offer. Thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I maybe have the last one, if possible. Yeah. Oh, you have you have been uh, looking at your watch, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was thinking about um, the way you proposed uh, of, uh, of design to to create. Period um, is uh, quite a paradigm shift to what we've known uh, of what design has to be and how to do stuff. Mm -hmm. so it's, um, we kind of, uh, or the thing you showed us. Uh, uh, it's like the human part, which is of uh, understanding the, the task at hand and breaking it down to analyze the, the parameters and uh, and um, and those those information you received, you give it along or you teach it in a way to the machine, like you showed us from the drawing the circles and and giving it um, to the machine to do it, mm -hmm. teaching it and. Um, and then I'm thinking like, okay, you, you give the machine the information and the machine uh, uh, is actually the, the, the thing that uh, designs, that uh, takes the information and makes a picture out of it. And then uh, we look at a picture and the process starts anew. Uh, like you showed the example of the pavilion. So it's uh, like a co-creating thing between the machine and the, and the people. And hopefully something comes out of it uh, like uh, the climbing facade you showed us, or uh, 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 of the tower, uh, which uh, we look at it and think, okay, that's kind of weird. Uh, is it more expensive? And you said, no, it's actually quite simple. So we create something we couldn't have imagined in that way. So do you think uh, this this is like a tool of um, okay, we're giving the designing part to machine, and we uh, through this co-creating. Uh, thing we can do things which are not possible which we do if we do it on your own uh, of our own yeah yeah okay well i still wouldn't call it designing by the machine but co collaborative design yes the, well the the main point is that uh, it's this shift from mass production to mass customization the machine really doesn't care if it gets a different value every time it uh, produces something. It, uh, the CNC routers or other machines cutting pieces of steel, cutting pieces of wood in different uh, forms. These machines are actually built to do a different thing every time. They don't care. So the machines don't think like that. Huh? They just basically execute uh, or they're crunching the numbers that are given to them so but because they can do that they are capable of this and you take advantage of it i think you can call it some form of collaboration and in any way it's machine to machine communication and they have to be on the same level to be able they, they have to talk the same language and so they are in the same boat so to say they talk the same language and that they work together to create that part so if you don't establish that direct link which uh, we are happy to call the sort of link of the idiot savant, you know, those uh, people who can read telephone books and memorize every single number. It's, it's that capacity, basically, that we are working with. And so our machines and the, the, the design, design instrument, uh, the, the whole thing actually is the instrument. Uh, the software part and the hardware part, they actually act like that. There's this direct link from one to the other. So they can actually explore, ex ex um, take advantage of that vast database of numbers, possible numbers to use. So if you don't set up your system like this, you are lost. You will be, it will be complicated very expensive, a lot of uh, rules, exceptions, etc. So you must make sure that what you do is without exception. So exceptions are, are not good. So the rule is the rule. You have to be very strict with that. But the good thing is you can design the rule. 
So it's not anyone that designs the room for you, you design the room. So that's the basic design <coughs> aspect of, uh, of our work. Defining the rules in such a way that they can relate to the, the machines, uh, that they can be produced, that they can be materialized because it's a virtual ID that is materialized and that they crystallize into our material world. That's basically what we are saying and what we are doing. So yes, the question is, are you, yeah, are you ready as a designer to do that and take advantage of that possibility? Are you ready to be the idiot savant and take advantage of the numerous possibilities and the huge potential that it, that it gives you? Thank you. Yeah, and what is your answer? Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Cass, we have one question from YouTube, a YouTube user. Okay. Uh, it says a down to earth practical question. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to apply your ideas to the typical Dutch row house housing projects, which use standard elements to make these attractive and affordable? Um, well, then that question refers back to standard elements. And what I'm talking about is the new standards, you know, which is customized form of standard. So the standard is in the rules of the connections and of the rules of the game. That's very standard, but it's a new form of standard. It's not the standard in the sense that components are the same. And I also added to that that. Yes, components can be the same. No problem is that if you want to have all exactly the same, no problem. But still, you would, know, you would need to design it in such a way that it's potentially different. OK. So, cast tell Are me. you muted? We can't hear you. You have to push. Unmute again. I was, for some reason, the connection was uh, distorted. Um, yes, so uh, it comes down to that new standard that is inclusive. And the new standard is inclusive of the old standard, so it builds a new level on top of it. It doesn't replace it in that sense, it doesn't compete with it, but it's actually a new attitude that includes it. Uh, thank you, Kaz. I think we have, we don't have time, but we would allow one more question. Okay, and, no problem. Anybody one last question? The last chance to talk with Cass from living room to living room. Hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's not my living room. <laughs> um, I, I, I adapted uh, the room to a working space. Yeah, what is living, what is working? Yeah. I would like to, I would like to ask a question. Um, the last project you show you showed us the manic uh, this apartment that changes uh, the furniture. Mm -hmm. um, well, in in this um, project you you use a, a old system that we have already the bed and the, mm -hmm. the furniture the classical ones. Mm -hmm. um, no, um, why don't you? Well, I, I don't want to um, tell you how you have to design, but um, you have already um, a system that you're using. And then here you are trying to adapt uh, the old system with, with the new technology. Mm -hmm. Why is there, is there a next step that? Yeah. Or... yeah, you're completely right. That's the next step. I mean, as I said, you, you probably don't do everything at, at the same time. 
it really goes step by step. And the main thing is that basically to evolve it further, you need clients. You simply need someone who says, I want that. I want, and then when we start doing this, we will innovate the very components where it's actually that are programmed, like the kitchen, the bed, etc. Naturally, we will look, have a look into that. Yes, sure. This was only to, to evoke that idea of uh, programmability and the beauty of an empty space when it's not used. Okay. I think, uh, I think many people would share that idea that empty spaces are beautiful somehow. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was just wondering because uh, you were also talking about um, um, you have to get rid of that uh, thinking um, um, to to adapt old uh, system with uh, with the new configuration. Yeah. So well, yeah, you're completely right. So it's a good uh, observation. You could, for example look at the space station interior that we designed and 20 years ago, apply this to that generic space 